Behind the Bulb is a deep dive into the ideas and industries of our world. Have you ever looked at a structure and asked, whatever happened to the people that built this? What motivated those people to wake up in the morning and head off to work? No matter the occupation, these are real questions. Put simply, why do we do what we do? This season, we focus on the building industry. We know the basic principles of how things are built, but we often don't know the narratives of the people involved in building them. Lend us your ears as we unfold their journey. Whether you are a part of the building industry or not, we think you will enjoy listening to these inspiring stories. Welcome to Behind the Bulb. I'm Brendan McCartney. And I'm James Young. On this episode, we have Christina Marquez. She currently works and lives within San Diego, California. She's had quite the path where at one point she was on the practice squad for the USA Women's Olympic softball team. She was even a valet in Las Vegas, but now she can be found at a high school or speaking to potential candidates for the Electrical Training Institute. And she uses her own career and her own life as an inspiration for what she does. And it's very clear that she loves what she's doing. And not everybody can say that. So what are those ingredients? Let's play ball. All right. We're excited to have Christina Marquez. An alumnus of San Diego State University and a former softball player for the Aztecs and formerly trained as a journeyman sound technician. I guess you could say she does it all. I guess. Mm. Uh, But what we really want to know, Christina, what is your favorite sport? Baseball. Of course. (laughs) When I wrote that out, I was like, well, she was a softball. (laughs) Clearly, she (laughs) likes baseball. Yep. Baseball. (laughs) You said baseball, not softball. Well, okay, here we go. So there is a difference, big time. Um, But when I was younger, like eight, I wanted to be, I wanted to play in Little League. And that was in the 80s, early 80s. And my mom and dads were like, no, I don't think that's a good idea for you, Christina. And, uh, Years later, my mom was like, I should have let you play in Little League. You would have done really well. (laughs) And I was always, so it's kind of been in me all my life to do better than the guys, (laughs) I guess, or be just as good, if not better, and somehow prove that I'm just as good as them. So it's Mm -hmm. kind of in me. And I think that's what made me want to be an electrician. Right. Is the challenge, I guess. Did, did uh did you have any siblings that pushed that? Was there a rivalry? A younger or something? brother. You just beat up on him. Uh, yeah, <laughs> until he got bigger. <laughs> he's, he's like six foot. I'm five four, so um, but he's always been a really good brother in that he, he let me beat up on him now that I found that out. Even today we're always like competing. Mm-hmm. A friendly competition, but competing, so it's just kind of how we are, I guess. Well, I know, like, with younger <laughs> siblings, no matter how big they get, like, the older sibling can always kick the younger sibling's butt, no matter what. I don't know if it's just a... Physically, my brother could kick my butt. <laughs> <laughs> he's big. But, um, like, he's just a strong guy. And mentally, he's probably just as strong mentally as me. But then smart, we're smart in different ways. So, like, he loves reading manuals he'll read a whole manual on something and then remember it and be able to fix it or work on it and do it and me i'm like i'm not going to read that i'm just going to work on it and figure it out without doing that so we're kind of different in those aspects so it when it comes to the sport of baseball (laughs) what is it about the sport is it the because you know you got bit you got basketball you got football Mm -hmm. they've got different qualities about them there's like athleticism in general Right. And, but with baseball, you start talking about hand eye coordination, things like that. And there's like a a larger scheme across the whole game that's much bigger. Oh, yeah. I I mean, just in pro baseball alone, you go down to, you know, for instance, the San Diego Padres and AJ Preller, and he's the one doing these last minute trade deadlines, trade deals before the deadline to get the team prepared for possibly the playoffs. And then you go down to like the manager, Chase Tingler, who has to 
make sure that his pitchers are prepared and what pitchers does he have? Does he have a pitcher for this inning or that inning or two innings or a lefty or a righty? Who's coming up? You know, how many players do they have left on the bench? How many players does the other team have on the bench? Can this player bunt? Can this player steal? Can this player, I mean, there's just so many things that could happen and just by one little, you know, change or addition or omission or anything. So I love it. Strategy involved. Oh, so much. It's not just people uh, swinging around a stick. It's not just people. (laughs) (laughs) No, definitely not. And then that's another thing is like practice really does make perfect. And there's a huge mental side of sports, all sports, mental uh, I had a great coach at Palomar Community College, Mark Eldridge, and he was the one who taught me about the mental side of it. He actually made us write, read books and stuff like that um, from Jackson, the old Lakers coach, stuff like that. You know, we would have to visually see ourselves getting in the batter's box, getting ready to swing, the pitcher pitching it to you. Is it a ball or a strike? What pitch is it? Do I swing? Do I not swing? And then swinging the perfect pit, uh, bat at the pitch. Yeah, and so doing ja- that hundreds of times in your head. Jack, Yeah, Jackson uh, uh, took a, an Eastern philosophy approach to some of his training for basketball. Yeah. So I can imagine yeah. what you're talking about there is, is closely knit to some of the... Like he, I, he would practice yoga with the players oh, yeah. and stuff like that and like um, get into the spirituality of it. But then... A lot of it was formed around success on the court, success in the field. Yeah. Um, I wish I would have known about yoga when I was in college because I wouldn't have pulled as many muscles, that's for sure. (laughs) (laughs) The mental conditioning, I think, is probably the The point where most people break. For any athlete to go to that next step. Because even when I graduated college and then I did play on the practice squad for the USA team, the Olympics, the women's Olympic USA practice team. And once I got there and was like playing, I was like, I can't do this anymore. I have to risk my body. I don't have a life, you know? And it was like, okay, I'm done. I enjoyed it. I love it. Still love it. But that was it. And it's, you know, cause I had to bring it up another notch physically and mentally. And I was like, nope. I'm done. <laughs> well, there's, there's got to be a wall, right? I, my, yeah. my cousin, my cousin uh, was on that same path with soccer uh, yeah. for, 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 for women's soccer, and she was playing on a collegiate level. Level, and then what happened was, is she got into a, tra- a training camp scenario where it was getting pushed to limits that were way beyond what she was comfortable, mm-hmm. and it was noticeably for somebody who had like loved the sport and still does, but was like. I'm going to walk away. Was there a, a like a wall or that was it? That was it when I was playing with that the USA practice team and we were playing against Australia and there was a ball that I would have had to drive, dive for straight ahead while playing center field, running straight ahead and diving straight forward. And uh-uh. I couldn't make <laughs> myself do it because I'm scared. Okay, what if my glove gets under my body? I break my wrist. I Like, I don't know. It's not worth it for me. And then there was in the back of my mind, like, you know, there's been times where I've been at games, like a soccer game or something, and you hear this pop. And it's because somebody, like, totally snapped their calf muscle or, I don't want to do that. No. No, thanks. (laughs) And and so when you ask it, it's interesting. Like, think about it. You ask a professional baseball player, a professional softball player. Can't um, be scared. Yeah. And you ask them, hey, what is it that you do? Do you think... What do you think they respond with? Like what if like I say I run into a professional b- uh, baseball player at a bar. I don't know who he is, but we're just catch a oh, nice guy or, you know, it's like, oh, who's this? And uh, what, what do you do? I play baseball. That's that's it. And then if somebody wants you to elaborate, then you will. Otherwise, you're just like, I play baseball or I play softball or soccer. And so if, if someone asks you, <laughs> what is it that you do? What would you say? I'm an outreach coordinator for Electrical Training Institute. <laughs> yeah, I'm I'm lucky to be able to do that. It's like a dream job that I never knew I could have. <laughs> but there's so and what's interesting there is like there's so much more to it than what people tend to it's it's hard to in some ways it's hard to communicate what you do because you can say the topical thing like I'm a baseball player, or I'm an <laughs> outreach coordinator. Right. But and then they're like, that, what's that? 
Like, yeah, what's right. Like, that? <laughs> Especially now during COVID. Well, what do you do now that there's no outreach, like mm-hmm. emphasizing out? It's all virtual right now. So, yeah, I'm I'm able to do outreach. If you can believe it, I'm just as busy. I've been able to do a lot of virtual presentations to high school kids, a couple of middle school classes, some veterans, uh, women's committees, and then, and you know. Sp- and specifically for what, for what field? For the electrical industry. So our apprenticeship is, has two programs, uh, Inside Wireman, which is a five-year program, and Sound and Telecommunications, which is four years. So I basically talk about that. And then we're also trying to convey to people that there is an opportunity for a pre-apprenticeship as well, which is right now just held once a year. So that's great for people who are just getting out of high school um, and they're not sure and they don't want a huge commitment like four or five years. Instead, you just commit to eight weeks. One of the things we've I think most people can think of is that you look at a skyscraper or you look at any construction that's happening in the city or town and you think, well, uh, who's who's building these uh, places? And you, you start to figure them out and you're like, oh, this, this person's here, that person's there. It's like this trade's here. But then you ask the question, how did why, how did they get there? And then you start reflecting back on like, wait, it's got to be coming from high school, the education system. You know, how does that work? Or is it? I mean, you don't know what their story is. I didn't know I was going to be in the electrical industry. You know, like we already talked about, I played softball all my life. I knew when I graduated high school, I wanted to get a softball scholarship. I did that. I've completed uh, college with a bachelor's in criminal justice, a minor in sociology. And then I was like, what do I do now? Like, okay, let's try and be a cop. No, okay, I'm not going to do that. Okay, well, I'm going to go live with my parents in Vegas. And I ended up parking cars, valet parking cars in Vegas for 12 years. I was only supposed to be in Vegas for a year. <laughs> oh, good money. I suppose. That's probably some good stories. <laughs> hey, good stories. Yeah, yes. that job. <laughs> uh, yeah, especially when I worked graveyard at the Palms you get good in tips. its heyday. Yeah, definitely good tip. That's why I got stuck there because it was such <laughs> easy money. I mean... I mean, it's different now there. It was great. But then there came a point, you know, I was like, I have a bachelor's degree. I'm smarter than this. Why am I? I mean, not to say that it's a horrible job. It's you can make a career out of it if you want to keep doing it. But for some reason, there was something in there in me that wasn't satisfied enough. I do know people that have been doing it for 20, 30 years and they're totally satisfied. And that's great. It's great money. You, you can earn a pension depending on who you're working for and you make a good relationship for the people that come in all the time. And it's fun. It doesn't feel like work a lot. So it's great. But for me, for some reason, I just had this calling to move back to San Diego. So April, who works for ProCal Lighting, was had looked for something like this because she was looking into the energy side of it, solar, renewable energy, stuff like that. And when she was in it, and I was like, "What? How is this? How is this school free? And you're you're getting paid to work and learn? Okay, I need to look into this. And because at first I was like, nothing's free in life, you know. And uh, once I did the research and found out about it, I was like, okay, it really is free. You just pay for your books and your tools. And I had no construction experience whatsoever, so I had no clue." all of the things that are up inside of a ceiling and no clue. So when you see a building being built and you're like, gosh, it's taking them forever to build this building. If you actually work on the building, you'll understand why, because the electricians are doing the electrical work, but not only are they doing the electrical work, they got to be there first to dig the holes, to put in the electrical wires that are underneath the building. Then once that's done, then the cement slab is built. Then once that's done, I mean, there's just so much. And I'm, I left out a bunch of stuff in there because there's excavation. There's the carpenters that have to do the wood for the concrete. It's amazing. And then all of the little, especially now in these days with everything being wireless, the, the data and the fiber optics in there, it's just amazing to me how buildings are built. I, like my first job, I was just in awe. 
I couldn't believe it. <laughs> and it almost never goes away. It, no. It, 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 and uh, how do they make the pyramids? That's what I always ask Ooh, myself. Like, yeah. Gosh. Couldn't imagine, like, no machines to help you. <laughs> yeah. A hundred people. Yeah, no shoes. <laughs> no shoes. No steel toe boots. No steel toe. Yeah. yeah. No safety glasses. No gloves. So I, the way you talk, you talk about the work that you're now involved with, do you count the hours, you know, of your week or you just, you operate? No way. No. So I am on salary and it doesn't feel like the amount of hours I put into it. Because basically when I wake up, I start working because I don't just do, I don't just talk to people about the outreach. I also maintain all our social media and I try and help maintain um, most of the updates for our website. And then I also, you know, if my training director, assistant training director, any they need anything, you know, updating the website or, hey, I need you to help go do this or do that, I'm, you know, I'm on it. So what, so, what are one of the, if you're interacting with uh, potential, like a high school student who uh-huh. comes to you and says, uh, you know, you know, college, I'm thinking about going to this place or maybe I'm, I'm going to do sports here or I don't. Just that, that, what do you tend to say to that student? So there's a lot of that because their whole life, they're, they've been told to go to college, go to college, go to college, go to college, but they don't like school. I tell them to go with what makes them happy. If your parents want you to go to college and they're going to pay for it, do that and make them try and make them happy. But if you're not happy, then know that we will be here an apprenticeship will be here. Like there's 22 apprenticeships in San Diego County alone, but I don't want you to just go to the electrical industry just because I'm talking to you. I want you to find what you like because I don't want you to get into our apprenticeship. And then a year later you quit because you realize you don't like it. So that's kind of what I tell them. I'm all, I almost feel like a life coach sometimes. Cause I'm just like, you know, I was in your shoes. I didn't know what I wanted to do. And I totally understand how you feel. The only reason why I went to college was because I wanted to play softball. So there is a lot of other people like my, the training director, Kevin Johnson. He is, he was, he's really good in school, super uber smart. And he played sports as well. And he completed college and, and did really well in college. And, but then he got into the electrical industry as well and went through our apprenticeship. So he knows exactly how I feel. And that, that was one of the first things he told me when I came on as outreach coordinator is, okay, we get tons of applicants. We get over a thousand applicants um, a year. We don't have problems with people applying for the apprenticeship. What we want to try and get is those people who think that college is the only thing and they're like A and B students, but they have a knack for building and figuring out how to work on things and they like tools and they like working as a team. Those are the ones we want to try and capture. And let them know that, hey, look, you can work with Tinker Toys all your life, but just on a bigger scale. Building things and working together as a team and, you know, starting with dirt and building this immaculate building. So it's it's kind of. It's interesting, too, because you, Pat, you followed your passion with softball. Yeah. Until you got to a point of like, I'm done, thrown in the towel. Yeah. I got I I accomplished what I wanted to accomplish. I'm going to go into this discovery period and fun, you know, the moment of just exploring your valet in Vegas, <laughs> having a blast, earning money, not a bad place to be, right? Your it's discovery period. And eventually you hit a wall and you're like, not from like okay, what am I going to do here, right? So you kind of had that moment. In some cases, that's a familiar thing for most people, right? They All right, I got college out of the way or uh or I went through the apprenticeship program and eh, maybe college is for me, right? Whatever yeah. whatever the flip may be. I imagine, though, when you were younger, there was a job where you did count the hours and you're like, uh, <laughs> this job is just, I'm just, I just need to get some cash and I'm, I, you know, I'm part time. I'm, I'm working at a grocery store or something like that. I don't know. What, what Was there one that you were like definitely most hated? Hostessing at restaurants. <laughs> <laughs> so boring. Yeah, that was, I didn't like that job, but. Mm-hmm. To help pay the bills, I guess. Right, right. So sometimes you gotta do it. Builds yeah. character. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. Well, and that's the thing, you know. So when I moved to Vegas, you know, I just, I guess, I was just an immature person, and I had to grow up. 
you know, there's some people, there's definitely a lot more people out there that are more immature than me. And I'm still more immature than a lot of other people. And I don't know when that will ever change. Probably never. I don't think it'll ever change. And even if I wanted to change, I don't think I could. (laughs) So, uh, you know, I'm just going to stay young and just. I think it makes you more approachable. Yeah. And when you go into the settings of the schools, like kids can approach you. You're not like a scary person. Yeah, no, I hope so. Yeah, I don't want to be a scary person. That's for sure. But I, I'm hope I noticed now, like when I would go in and talk to a school, whether it be in the classroom or whether it be in a big auditorium setting, um, they wouldn't really ask many questions. Sometimes there would be, it would usually be the teacher, the instructor that would ask more to get things moving. Mm -hmm. Now, doing this virtual they're a little more proactive and they'll actually ask me questions because we're not in the same classroom i guess so it's kind of interesting how that happens you know i get some good questions now when i'm after i do my presentation with the kids and then i let them know they can call or text me a lot of them text so they text me and then you know i try and answer the questions that way and then i'll end up just calling them and then they answer but so it works out so that's cool. Yeah. That's yeah, cool. it's it's a good feeling job actually. I'm really lucky that you know when this job came out, I applied and interviewed and they chose me because, you know, this definitely is where I want to be. The students, I think can tell when I'm talking to them. They feel the passion in me. They know that it changed my life. They know that this is a career because I tell them my story. Okay? This is I, I wasn't the best at school and school wasn't really my thing. If it is more power to you, go to school, do your thing. You know, Um, just like, like I said before, just remember we're here. We'll be here. I've been here for 75 years. And you know, if, if you go through college and then you realize, eh, then come see me, we'll be here. You know, and you can start, we, we have 50 year old apprentices. I didn't start till I was 35. It's never too late. It's not. (laughs) (laughs) No, and it's been an amazing, it's it's been amazing, you know, working with IBEW um, Local 569, which is the Electrical Workers Union here in San Diego and Imperial Counties. It's definitely been like a family affair kind of thing. Before I even got into the apprenticeship, I was volunteering on precinct walks and got really involved with the legislative committee and that's kind of what's been driving me. Uh, now that I work for the school, though, I ha- kind of have to be like Switzerland. Mm. So that's a little difficult for me, but I totally get it. You know, being a school, we can't be political at all. And that's fine. But mm. I feel a little bit behind. I've never heard the uh, term Switzerland to describe <laughs> like neutrality. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. We know that you're a, a caged <laughs> animal, James. Yeah. <laughs> I'm in my four by four every day, just in front of a screen. This little cube. (laughs) We're going to get you a bubble. All right. Yeah, I need to get outside more, (laughs) evidently. I was thinking a good Halloween costume would be those bubble things. Yeah. Like we all just wear bubbles and just like a fishbowl. Yeah, like a fishbowl. It's like, wait, it's COVID. Don't get near me. I'm in my bubble. I asked my uh, the Amazon Alexa. I said, "What should I be for Halloween?" And she told me, "John Stamos." <laughs> Just what? John Stamos. John Stamos. Oh no! <laughs> you kind of resemble him a little bit. You could you could pull it off. I'm sure. So go home and ask, ask a certain Alexa. angle. <laughs> That's funny. Uh, some what I'm hearing, and correct me if I'm wrong. What is it uh, that? What is the opportunity that you saw in? coming to San Diego back from Vegas and you, you were like, what? Uh, edu- <laughs> I just got to get the, the, by the books and the tools and I'm in and I uh, just got to, I well, can uh, learn. What was, the, was there, what did you see there? Well, it's not that easy. <laughs> um, you definitely have to go through a process. You have to apply and then you have to take an aptitude test, which consists of math and reading and then if you pass that, then you're in an oral panel interview. I felt I was ready for it, though. It really helped that I did valet for 12 years because when that question came about, and I'll never forget it, it came from Andrew Berg, Andy Berg. He's the, the NECA business manager, which is the National Electrical Contractors Association. And he said, so how do you think you're going to be out there 
doing electrical work, working with all the guys. And I said, well, I've been in Vegas for 12 years doing valet with all guys. So I think I'll be all right. And he's like, okay. <laughs> <laughs> and I was just super confident in all of my answers. And just, I think they could tell that I had this determination in me, similar to how I wanted to play little league when I was a kid, the same thing. It was the same thing. Like, I wanted to be just as good, if not better than the guys, and I could prove it. And I'm going to prove it to you guys. And you were throwing strikes. And I was throwing strikes. <laughs> That's right. And I was trying to hit them out of the park, but I'm more of a, uh, you know, line drive, opposite field, Tony Gwynn type of hitter. So I just get to second, which was fine <laughs> with me, too, because then I'd eventually score. <laughs> Brian scores, yeah, RSP. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, so James had no clue what you just said. Yeah, right? no. <laughs> We, uh, so you're trying to get MVP. <laughs> that there you go. <laughs> yeah, you're not after the big trophy. You just you know. No, my uh, OB at on base percentage was it was really good. Oh, yeah. yeah. So I was hit, hit either I usually hit either second or fifth because I was pretty good at pretty witty at getting on base. Like it didn't matter how I got on base. I was just gonna get on base whether it be walking or you know throwing down a bunt or slapping the ball or did you steal? Yes, you're still, you're I was still, fast then. Fast. Yeah, 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 not fast now. <laughs> in the brain, you're fast yeah, in the brain. Fast, yeah. yeah. <laughs> I try and play some slow pitch softball, and it's not good. I get super mad at myself because I think I could, you know, like I try and play like I, I used to play, and that it doesn't work. <laughs> Your mind wants to, but the yeah. body doesn't. Nope, agree. not at all. Yeah. <laughs> One thing that I I I'm, I'm hearing is that. You, when you're speaking to some of the high school students, your own path serves as an inspiration for the very thing that you're tasked with doing. Do you find this to be a very peaceful experience? And do you think that that's why you love what you do? I think that because I am speaking from the heart, that yes, it's super easy for me to convey it to them and I think that they go oh she's a normal person just like me and she's nothing special and look where she is now and she thrived in the industry so yeah I hope I hope that it influences them I mean there has been a few people that I've spoken with and one of them he's a great kid he's an apprentice now he's in his second year and I still remember him when I first met him it was at the Grossmont a career expo and his name is Zachary Grubbs and he comes comes up to me and he goes I want to be an electrician I said awesome okay good I was like here here's information on what you need to do he's like okay I'll I'll do it as soon as possible and like within that week he had all of his stuff turned in already applied and and there's you don't understand there's a lot of people that do that like there's a lot of people that say oh yeah I want to do it I'm going to do it da, 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 da. nothing happens they don't call they don't text they don't email nothing this guy was on it and like less than a year later, he was an apprentice and he is doing really well. And that's just one example. I know that there has been some people who I go in like at Orange Glen High School. I've talked to the mechanic classes there, like all eight of them in one day. That was tiring. <laughs> <laughs> but um, I know there's a few guys and one gal that had call me and they're like, yeah, you know, I want to get into this. I want a career. I want to do something with my life because I think that they don't think they're going anywhere. And so when they learn about this from me, they're like, yes, yes, there is hope for me, you know, mm -hmm. and they because they, they thought, oh, I'm just going to be a mechanic. And being a mechanic is good if you can pay for a really good education in mechanic school. But that's really expensive. That's like fifteen thousand dollars just to be to go through one of those courses to be a mechanic. And then even then, where are you going to work? Like, do you have a place to work? Or are you going to have steady work? So, you know, getting into this industry with our apprenticeship, you you know, you have medical, you have dental, you have vision, you have a pension that you start earning from day one. So they're taken care of not only by learning about the electrical side of it, but they're taken care of on the physical side of it as well. And then their family is taking care of it. So if they have kids or if they get married, they're covered as well. And they're getting regular raises mm -hmm. every six months or every year, depending on the program they go into. So it's just like, it's a win, win, win. 
That's all it is. And it, it sounds too good to be true a lot of times. And it's not. It's just you really, if you want to get into it, you just really have to go for it. You have to be all in. That's it. <clears throat> is it like the first like five years is probably pretty tough? Well, if you're in the apprenticeship, yeah, it's tough. I mean, you're going to school two nights a week. You want to do well in school. You want to learn everything they're teaching you. Because if you just get by, you're going to be an okay journeyman. You're not going to be able to lead others as confidently as you should. And so you're going to school two nights a week. You're working Monday through Friday. You're getting yelled at by your foreman or your journeyman or both to like hustle up and get this and get that. And, da, 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 da. and then you have your life too. So <laughs> it's tough. It's it's really tough. Yeah. But, but the reward is so worth, worth it. it. Yeah, because, you know, a lot of... Like in your case, you went to get a degree yep. in a regular college, right? And then you never, you're <laughs> not like a cop or you're not, you know what I'm saying? Do you have a FBI agent? Do you have a desire yeah. still to utilize that? No way. Uh, no way. <laughs> <laughs> I'm so glad I didn't become a cop. Oh, yeah, I feel for you. Now. I feel for you. Yeah. All yeah. the cops right now. But yeah, it's been a great ride. Hopefully, um, you know, we can keep this ride going and just keep uh, trying to educate the community about these opportunities and apprenticeship, letting them know because it's weird. I don't understand. I am talking with I talk with a lot of the school districts. There's over 100 school districts, I found out. <laughs> and uh, I do talk with the biggest ones, of course, like Vista Unified, San Marcos Unified, Escondido Unified, Poway, um, San Diego Unified, Sweetwater all of those, um, and then more. And still there's a lot of people that don't know about it. Mm -hmm. And, uh, I want everybody to know about it. I wonder, Christina, mm -hmm. if you were taken and transported mm -hmm. to a completely different industry and say, for instance, in this case, you're not educating about electrical, but you're educating about, or you're, you're outreaching, for um, farmers, mm -hmm. right? a group of farmers in uh, Kansas, and uh, you're going to the local high schools and things like that to try to talk to potential students who perhaps need guidance and they need a place to go for work and as a career. Is Would that be just – would you be rah-rah farmers? Well <laughs> – the farming industry goes back into my family. So, yes, <laughs> you picked the wrong kind. Yeah, <laughs> definitely would. <laughs> so my dad was born and raised in Holtville, California, which is near El Centro, which is all farming. He had to pull cabbage starting at age five, pulling cabbage and farming and fishing and helping the family of 13 kids. So, yeah, farming is a big deal to me. <laughs> You bad know, I think bad example, bad example. <laughs> yeah. but I think that if I went through the iron workers program or the sheet metal workers program, I would have the same passion that I would have because as long as it's union, at least for me, because being in the union for me, one means I get equal pay. You know, it doesn't matter that I'm a woman or a minority. A woman is a minority, but also being a Latina woman. So I'm getting the same pay as the rest I get. There's no wage gap. So for me, I tell people, you know, especially women or minorities, get into a union. If it's not going to be the electrical industry or a trade, get into a teacher's union, get into the grocery workers union, get into some sort of union because you get the same benefits. And unfortunately, there still is a wage gap if you're a minority or a woman, so, yeah, if I went into a different industry and went through that, my passion would still be there. Definitely. Do you feel like you provide opportunity or direction for lost people? I hope so. Yeah, I, I really do hope so. And there has been some times like where I, I'm looking at students while I'm talking to them and I see the light bulb in their eye. Like, I see it. Like, yes, I'm saved. I found my calling. This is what I need to do. Is that the most satisfying part of the job? I love it. It's so rewarding. So during this pandemic, 
there's a lot of people out of work, right? We couldn't get enough people to work, enough electricians to work because the work was still going on. It seemed that there was a lot of, you know, like older journeymen or older people or people with kids or people that lived with their grandparents or parents and they didn't want to get them sick. So they decided to stay home and not work. So we couldn't get enough. The IBW, when I say we, the IBW local hiring hall uh, couldn't get enough people to fill those calls. So I text everybody I knew that was applying and looking for work. And six of those people are now working because of it. That was rewarding for me. Knowing that I helped these people who were out of work to get into this industry, get their foot in the door while they're waiting to go through the application process for our apprenticeship. That was the best. That was a good feeling. Do you believe in (laughs) destiny? (laughs) I'm so lucky and I do owe a lot of it to um, the people that work for IBEW in the, on the staff, starting with like Gretchen Newsom, our political director. I feel like she kind of took me under her wing or I just followed her and tried to do the good things that she's been doing. Or um, Nicholas Segura, our former uh, business manager, he kind of took me under his wing and like groomed me, I guess you can say. Same with David Taylor. He was our president for IBEW and he, he was the one who really took me under his wing at the very beginning, took me to those precinct walks and told me, here, you need to do this or go talk to this person, go talk to this person and just kind of get to know these people so that they could get to know you so they could see your passion that you really want to do this. And then uh, having Kevin Johnson as my training director, I think him being a collegiate athlete and then him going through the apprenticeship and now he's the training director, I feel that he's kind of guided me as well. Sounds yeah. just like a sports team. <laughs> yeah. You know, you have all, you're, you're like the rookie. <laughs> I am the rookie. Yeah. Kevin definitely is a quarterback. <laughs> he's, <laughs> he's the one who's, uh, he's definitely um, aligned everybody. He has a great team. Uh, James Stark, our assistant training director, John Campbell, sound and telecommunications coordinator. John and I were in the same class. So we go way back and we worked together when we were both apprentices. So that's, awesome that we get to work together now. We have a great team and all of us went through the apprenticeship. So we all understand what the apprentices are going through. And so we know like when we were going through the apprenticeship, what we thought we could fix or needed to be fixed or adjusted or so it's, it's been a good ride. And I think it's in a really good place right now. I think we got a lot of good material. Yeah. I don't know. I think we got to go. Oh, I didn't I think I'd be able to talk this long, but yeah. I did. I'm, I told you at the beginning, I'm not much of a talker. Like, I'm a jock. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> That's all you do. I guess it is. Yeah, I think sometimes uh, Kevin will be like in his head, like, shut up. <laughs> I don't know. I don't know. Christina, we appreciate you coming yeah. today, uh, taking time out of your day. You have a wonderful story. <laughs> and we appreciate you share, sharing it. Thank you. You can admit the Kevin thing, though. <laughs> yeah, we can admit it. Well, like I said, you'll be we'll able to... to uh, yeah, I get to view it yeah, first? Yeah, you yes, get to hear it yes. first. You know what? I like it. I think it's good. It'll be good. And that's it for this week's episode. Thank you for your time. Thanks for listening. And if you could, please subscribe and share with your family and friends. Here's a sneak peek into next week's episode. Was there, like, anything like that? You know, I mean, you mentioned, like, everyone else was good at soccer, but was there, like, another hobby that, like, came naturally to you like what, uh, uh, I was good at trumpet which doesn't translate into anything in life no it, oh, are you kidding me the trumpet <laughs> yeah for that brief moment with maybe the ska as, as oh, that became really popular ska, but okay. I missed that whole thing yeah, so no, ska is beautiful yeah. man yeah you're not gonna not gonna win anyone's hearts with a trumpet these days no it's not a it's not a sexy instrument no I mean, trumpet? It, well it depends, I guess, on the it audience. Ki- it kills in the nursing homes. <laughs> yeah, I, yeah, exactly. The audience. Doesn't. Hey, Bruno Mars took the trumpet into the four, 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 you know, four yeah. final. Yeah, yeah, what's his trumpeter's name? Bruno Mars. Bruno oh, Mars. Oh, did he play the trumpet? Bruno Mars can dance. He can, will, can he? No. No. This podcast has been sponsored by ProCal Lighting. <laughs>